Good morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Shall we pray together? Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from two parts. The first from the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 11 to 16. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. To prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until and we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The second part is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the last two weeks, I have mentioned that the direction that we were to take as a church, uh, given that we have a vision to be the most attractive church to God and man, and that direction is to be an attractive church that is a disciple-making church. And we talk about disciple-making, what's the mission? How do we go about becoming a church that is a disciple-making church that will be attractive to God and to man? And that is the mission state, underlined by the mission statement that everyone is a disciple, but not just a disciple, but a disciple maker. And we have, uh, I've shared in the first two series of uh, this uh, sermon, which is the first thing that we ought to do in the roadmap to disciple making is engage. We need to go and engage those who are outside the wall of the church, the unchurched people, and also the next generation, the young people. Uh, these are the people that should be in our first and foremost concern. Secondly, we are to call to evangelize, to bring the good news to people. And today, we come to the third part of our roadmap, the third E, that is equipping. That is to help everyone to be mature in Christ. I invite all of us to pray together before I begin. Father, we thank you, O God, for your work in Jesus Christ. We thank you, O God, because of what Jesus Christ has done for us, that, Lord, we become your children. And, Lord, we pray that your purposes and your mission and your vision will be our church focus, our church purposes, and our church vision. Lead us and guide us. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There was a king who went hunting, and as he was hunting, he came across a tree. But what, was, what caught his attention about this tree is that on the tree is drawn a few targets, bullseye. And on each target, there is an arrow right in the middle of the target, on all of the target. So he was so surprised, and he told his uh, captain and said, 
wow, who is this archer? Fantastic fine archer. Every target, bull's eye. Wow, if I find this person, I'll make sure that this person be part of my army. And then came a young man with a bow and a quiver of arrows. And the young man overheard the king say that whoever is this person who shoot this arrow against the target, that person will be part of his army, his royal army. And so this young man said, I, I am the one, I am the one who shot the arrow. And the king was saying, really, it was you? You are the one who shot, you sure you're not the one who took the arrow and stuck it in the middle of the targets? The young man said, no, I shot it from a hundred paces away, a hundred steps away. And the king said, wow, that is so excellent. You, I want you, you will be part of my team, my soldier. And the young man gladly rejoiced that he's been chosen to be part of the army. Then the king, out of curiosity, and said, young man, how do you in such a young age become such an excellent and accomplished archer? And this is what he said, I shoot the arrows to the tree and then I draw a circle around it. <laughs> Friends, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, are we guilty of setting goals as we like and things that we think we can accomplish and we will not miss the target? Some Christians, after baptism, always say, I will come to church once a year. I'll be a good Christian. How to be a good Christian? It is a target that definitely you can't miss once a year. You know, as a church, do we set goals and purposes and missions because we like it? Is to our convenience? Friends, Jesus Christ has set us the target and the goal that we are to achieve as his people. And we see that in the passage that has been read to us in the book of Ephesians. Allow me to read to you from verse 11 to 13. And this is what it says. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the full measure of or the fullness of Christ. You see, friends, Jesus is the head of the church. Amen? And Christ has set for us what is the goal, the target that we ought as a church achieve. And that target is clearly underlined in the scriptures that God has gifted people in the church to be equipped so that the church together may become mature. And what is the maturity like? attaining the full measure attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ in this, the first thing that we learn about this verse is the goal of the church is to nurture mature Christians well there are many good things that at the church we target we want to do but what is the end goal what is the end goal of being an attractive church that is a disciple making what's the end goal of growing in Christ the end goal for you and I and for the church is to attain maturity in the fullness of Christ. And I like how a CEV, the version CEV says, it says, then we'll be mature just as Christ is and we will be completely like Him. Maturity, Christian maturity is not about how many years we have become Christian. It's not about how many accomplishments or how many ministries we have served in. It is not about these things. Maturity is measured by our being, our Christ-likeness. In other words, the more we grow, what is it that we want to see in our lives and in the life of the church? We want to see maturity in the likeness of Christ. Maturity is measured by the, thing, the way that we act and think like Jesus and so one of the marks of being mature is to be able to do what Jesus does. And what does Jesus do? Jesus is one that calls people to be his disciples and makes disciples. And of course, we know Jesus not only calls people to follow him, he helps them to grow in his likeness as well. I will send you out and make you 
fishers of men. He is a fisher of men, and so will people be like him. And therefore, friends, I like what Dawson Trotman, he is the founder of Navigators. I think a lot of you know about Navigators ministry. Yeah? Dawson Trotman is the founder of Navigators, and he says this, a person is mature physiology, physio, uh, physiologically when he or she can reproduce physically. So too a person is mature spiritually when he or she can reproduce spiritually. Now in the first two part of our roadmap, we talk about engage, right? And we talk about evangelize, right? Okay, we want to go out and reach out. We want to bring others to Jesus. But friends, it doesn't stop there. When we say we do what Jesus does is we reach out to others to bring them in so that they may grow into maturity and be able to do the same. When you engage somebody and bring them to Christ, that person has to be nurtured so that they too can reproduce spiritually. So our job is not done, right? It's not done that we, when we go out, engage, share the gospel, it doesn't stop there. Our job is to bring others, as Dawson Trotman says, evangelism is to disciple people. We evangelize to bring people so that we may disciple them. I don't know whether you can see the picture clearly. You will see that there is two strong arms that we need to have, not just one. You know, I am a right-hander, but the thing is, many things I do, I need both my hands. If I were to drive the car properly, I have to drive both, both my hands. I want to wash dishes, I wash both my hands. And if I want to untie a dog or tie a dog, I have to use both my hands. I can't just use one just because I'm very comfortable with that hand. Likewise, for some of us, we are good in reading the Bible, uh, uh, learning about the, the faith, uh, talking and debating about theological matters, but we need to also flex that arm of reaching out to others to engage and to evangelize. Well, some are so natural in telling others about Jesus, but then we must not forget that there's the other arm. You just don't just uh, approach and bring the person to God. We need to then grow the person. These are the two hands that we need to go hand in hand. We need to flex both arms. That outreach and nurturing is two things that we need to do at the same time. So when we talk about the goal of the church is to nurture mature Christians, not just converts, but mature Christ-like disciples. So it is not complete to just bring somebody to faith. And that's why we have courses like the F201 course for new believers. We have, brought, we have rejoiced that you know, people have come to faith and finally are uh, willing to openly confess they are followers of Jesus. But we just not want only converts, my friends. The work of God is not done. We need to nurture people to mature, to grow. John Wesley once says this. He said, Bringing someone to Christ without proper context for nurture is like giving birth to children for the devil. You bring them in to the faith, but you don't tell them how to grow and become more like Jesus. And therefore, it tells us the emphasis that we need to continually to grow people. That's why in our church, we have this equipped ministry that has been already shared in a pamphlet. And we look at the different areas where we, can, we are to grow people. And I know last week when we talked about evangelism, a lot of people are saying, okay, pastor, we are going to go, but how? Uh, how do we go about it? I'm so scared. Uh, I don't know how to say, what to say. You know, I've got, I've got so many fears. Now, if you look at your semester two, which starts in July, you will see a course, EM101, all right, under the evangelism and mission component. And that class, EM101, is a class that is tailor-made to help us to look at the area of reaching out to others with the gospel of Jesus, evangelism. And so, friends, this is where we want to equip people to help people to be ready to be able to do what God has called us to do. But equip is not just that. The first thing very important about equipping is that everyone, because we're talking about everyone is a disciple and is a disciple maker. To grow, everyone should belong to a disciple group. 
Because the Christian faith is not just a personal individual faith. That is what the world has taught us, that faith is a personal matter. But it's not. Through the scriptures, faith is a communal matter. It is, we are growing together as a body, as a people, as a house of God. Therefore, whether young or old, we need to be part of a disciple group. In our church, it's not just the adults are disciples, my friends. Children are disciples of Jesus. And therefore, in the Sunday school, we already have small groups. And in fact, this year, we are beginning more intentionally to introduce journaling across ages. Our young people, we are also looking that, that we are training our young people to lead in a disciple group, in their own group. So whether young or old, faith is to be done together in the context of a group. And therefore, I encourage, today in our statistics, we show that we have about 60 over percent of uh, regular worshippers who are in a DG, in a small group. Oh, 60 over, that's great. But what does it tell us? There's another 40 percent that is not in a disciple group. Friends, it's not about numbers. Don't get me wrong. We're not here for, to chase statistics. Jesus is not going to have a scorecard. Because the goal of the church is about being, right? A mature, mature Christ-like being. And therefore, we implore you to encourage you, if you're not part of a DG, be one, be part of one. That is the first thing. Everyone, young to old, should belong. And the word is belong. Belong means that you are part of a committed group who wants to do faith and do life together. That is what it means to belong. Of course, we talk about the equipped classes. And one of the things that we can begin doing is to attend these classes. Not so that, again, it's not about academic. Oh, I attend this course. Now I should be five points more mature. No, these are the courses to help us to learn and to study the Word of God better. Secondly, when we talk about nurturing mature Christians, the goal is to nurture Christians maturely in a DG. The next thing is that mature Christians must learn to feed on solid food. Allow me to read to you from the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. We have much to say about this, but it is hard to make it clear to you because you no longer try to understand. In fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truth of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, it is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The author of Hebrew is saying this about the Christians. He is saying that you have stopped trying to understand. You are dull in your hearing, in your understanding. You have become sluggish in your desire to grow and to learn. And that it, then therefore what happens is, by now, he said, actually by now you ought to be teaching others about the faith already. But yet, because of your sluggish learning desire, you have, be, you have to be taught again the elementary things. You should be taking solid food, but instead, you are just happily going on milk diet. Now, this is the issue that the author of Hebrews had with the Christians. Friends, many of us have been Christian, but friends, we must grow out of the years of infancy. Yes, when we first became Christian, many things we don't know. But after some time, we must begin to grow in our understanding of the Word of God. We must begin to be equipped because we are called to be mature in Christ. We must begin to migrate from taking on simple and uh, basic things to more solid things in Christ. But why? Why are people not growing? Why are people not becoming teachers Passing on the faith, leading others. Instead, they have to be taught again and again. I like this French proverb. It says, a good meal ought to begin with hunger. 
If you're hungry, everything tastes exceptionally delicious. I think some of you will know, you know, when you have traveled a long way and you're caught in a jam for hours, long past your dinner or whatever, and finally you came to this little joint or some place and they serve you some half past six noodles, uh, it still tastes tasty. Uh, because you're so hungry. The problem why these Christians were dull in their hearing, they're sluggish in their understanding, is because they have lost their appetite for something more solid and deeper. Friends, it is so crucial for us to have the appetite for the things of God, for His Word. Without hunger, without a sense of craving for God's Word, for deeper things of God, we will not grow because we are not seeking to be nourished. Third thing, it's not just individuals, but corporate maturity. It is not just about one or two of us or three of us growing in Christ-likeness, being able to be equipped with the Word and teach others, but the Scripture teaches us it is the entire church. Verse 13, until we all not certain people, not just the pastors and the leaders, until we all reach unity in the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. I think Pastor Danny in the prayer has prayed that we are a hundred over year old church, right? We are a established old church. But are we spiritually mature church? So something that we that challenges us to think. A church that is filled with uh, infant Christians or immaturity is in display is when the church is constantly bickering, constantly complaining and in divides, constantly thinking only of their own interests and what the church can do to serve them. These are signs of immaturity in Christ. But are we, as a church that God has planted over the years, have through the different areas of season of the life of the church, have grown to be a spiritually mature church? We ought, hopefully not what the Hebrews authors say, we, we ought to be people at this stage of the life of the church, to be teachers of the word, to impart to the next generation, and not to be the ones that are still grappling on, fin, on, on, on basic and need to be told, you need to, be read, you need to read your Bible, you need to pray. Friends, we are a church that needs to be not just an old established church, we need to be a church that is mature. And the church life as a community of faith must exhibit the maturity of Christ. That brings us to the second point. How do we then, together, as a church, grow mature? We know certain people are very mature in our church, but we are talking about everyone in the church. And that the point number two is this, we are to grow together by ministering to one another. The key to grow is to minister to one another. And we read that in verse 16. From him the whole body joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grow and build itself up in love as each part does its work. Grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The church needs to do some bodybuilding if we were to be a healthy, mature church. Bodybuilding in what sense? It's not to build a gym next to the church office. Though I think Pastor and Danny and I do need a bit of exercise sometimes. But that everyone has the task to build up the body. Everyone has the task. Listen to the word of the scripture. That all part of the ligament builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The church is you and I. You and I are every bit and parts of the church. All of us, young, old, men, women, 
very educated to simple education, rich, poor, established in society, or just an ordinary person, each of us are part of the body of Christ, and each of us have a task. Turn to the person next to you and say, you have a task for the church. Many people come to church to be filled by the church, like a sponge, to be filled by wonderful worship, by good sermons, by great fellowship. We soak in. Week in, week out, we soak it in. But friends, as the scriptures have told us, we need to ask God and allow God to do a bit of squeezing in our lives that we are given out because that is the way God has designed the church. Don't just soak in. It's time that we realize that for the church to become mature, it is our task to each and every one of us to build up the body. How? Firstly, we use to use our spiritual gifts. In verse 13, it's very clear. In verse 11, sorry. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers to equip the, his people for the works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Each of us are given different kind of gifts. Some are gifts that directly involve in the worship. For example, preaching, teaching, uh, leading of the worship, and many other areas. But some are given gifts uh, that is seen not so much in the worship proper, but in outside of the, uh, of the four walls. Gifts to do one-to-one -one follow up with people. Gifts to visit the sick and the poor. Gifts to uh, generate uh, finances to help alleviate poverty. There's so many gifts that is out there, but they are all the work of the body of Christ. So whether they are gifts that are given in worship proper, whether you're gifted as a teacher to teach the word, in preaching, in ministering through songs and psalms, or whether they are personal gifts to give to minister outside of the church, gift of compassion, of uh, helps, of mercy. All of us have gifts. And so it tells us there are two models that we need to avoid thinking about church ministries. Firstly, the church ministry is not a pyramid. The pastor sits on top there and we are like little pharaohs and all the rest all follow and become coolies. No, it's not the top and then all are... We are not. We are all gifted. And giving the gift, we respond to the call of God. I respond to the call of God and I'm using the gift that God has given me for my service for the body of Christ. So we are all in cooperation, in partnership. Some of you, God has gifted you with the gift of preaching, the gift of teaching. You partner with the pastoral team to do that part of feeding. Some of you are gifted in different areas. We together serve in our different capacities. The second model that we must debunk is the model of the bus driver. The pastor is not the bus driver and all the rest are sleepy passengers that goes around and follow where the pastor leads them. No, you are not a passive person in the church ministry. You are to be an active member of the church ministry. The word of the scriptures is very clear. You and I need to use our given gifts by God to serve one another. Niccolò Paganini is actually a very famous violinist and he once decided to donate his violin to his hometown. But his criteria or his condition is this. I will donate this beautiful instrument to you. You can keep it, you can display it, but no one can play this instrument again. You know what happens to that beautiful violin? Over time, it decay and rot. Very strangely, not used, just kept there, it began to rot and decay. No longer useful for its purpose. So friends, if you and I don't use the gifts that God has given us, we rot and decay inside of us. We are no longer able to grow healthily as a Christian because we are not using 
the purposes that God, the, the gifts that God has given us for the purposes He has designed them for. So, very important question: Why is it that Lord has gifted you? Seek the Lord, ask the Lord. How can I make it, make full use of it to build up the people of God? The second thing is this: If God has gifted us the gifting, whatever the gift is. God will give us the grace, the power to know how to use it. In verse 7, it says this, But to each of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. God did not give us something that He doesn't give us the enablement to do what we are gifted. Some of you are very creative. And Christ will inspire you greatly to do when you are given something uh, to allow the church to grow in terms of your creativity. There was a foreman who was a, a logging foreman, you know, the bala, all right? Uh, and he sold a chainsaw to a farmer. And he told his farmer, hey, you use this chainsaw instead of your normal axe, ah, you can cut at least 50 trees a day. Use this chainsaw. So the farmer said, okay, la, use the kappa, you know, wah, so slow. I would, he, since he said 50 trees a day, I buy. One week later, this farmer came back and went to this uh, foreman and threw this chainsaw and said, I want my money back. You told me that this chainsaw can help me to cut 50 trees a day. I hardly can cut three trees, three trees a day. I want my money back. And the foreman looked at him, three trees, less than three trees a day. And he looked at he took the chainsaw and he pulled the cord and the, machine, and the, and the chainsaw roared. And the farmer said, eh, what's the sound? Ah? <laughs> As Christians, why we are not experiencing the growth and also the empowerment of God? We are not tapping. If God has called us to do certain things, we need to ask for the grace that's already Christ prepared beforehand for us, a portion to you. As a pastor, there are many things that I need to do many things that is not my natural giftings, many things that is not my natural enablement, my natural inclination. But God, because He has called, has given me the grace enough for me to do what I'm being called in the area of pastoral ministry. In the areas that you're called, whether it is to follow up with a person, you have this natural thing, you are not good with big groups, but you're good with one to one. You know, ask the Spirit of God for discernment, for wisdom. Because when you talk to a person one-to-one, -one, ask God for a listening ear that you may hear the Lord speaking to you as you hear the person. Some of you are very good in serving, very quick in doing things, helping out. Ask the Lord for eyes to identify needs around you because you naturally respond to it. So there's so many areas. What God has gifted you, God has already apportioned grace for you to use them. Is whether we allow God to help us to pull that cord to allow the engine of Christ to be at work in us. The second thing about ministering to one another that we may build each other up is that every believer is to minister for mutual growth. For mutual growth. Friends, many times we tend to think that the pastor is responsible for your growth. To a certain extent, it is true. But the scripture is very clear that you and I are in a part of the body of Christ. And the scripture also teaches us that you and I have a job to do. We are responsible for one another. Build itself up as each part does its work. We are actually responsible to one another for each other's growth. I'm tempted to ask you to turn and say, I'm responsible for your Christian growth, but I think it won't work. Lah. So I won't ask you to turn. <laughs> Friends, we are responsible for each other's spiritual growth. We cannot think like the world. It's none of my business. Now, don't get me wrong. Lah. It is not permission to go and gossip about people or go and capo about people's life. You know, many times uh, we, we put people off because we ask with no genuine intention to care. We just want to know. Hey, how's your mom? Uh? 
It's not that we generally care about the person's mom and how the person's coping. We just want to know so that we have a topic to talk with the person in our DG or whatever else. No, I'm just saying that we are placed for one another to help one another grow. We must always remember that we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility for the other person's growth as well as the other person to us. John Wesley, when he was studying in Oxford, it was a time where uh, people struggled to be real Christians because the values of the society was very against Christianity. And of course, we know at the time where John Wesley, everyone are Christian because it's the religion of the nation. Everyone is Christian. But whether you're a real Christian, you're a living Christian, you're an active Christian, you are really uh, one that has a relation with Christ that is very questionable. Now, John Wesley in that time wanted to truly follow Jesus and to gather other fellow people to grow together, to be accountable, to be responsible to one another's growth. And so he gathered them. And together, they were nicknamed the Holy Group, the Holy Club. Because why? You know, it's very strange, you know, when the world is very corrupted, uh, what is right becomes an abnormality. Do you know that? For example, it is actually wrong to bribe. But because the world has turned upside around, if you don't bribe, something's wrong with you. Do you realize that? What is right becomes so difficult to exercise. What is right becomes something wrong because we live in an upside-down world. So John Wesley at the time lived in an upside-down world because the values of the world of sin and meeting our carnal desires have permitted the church and Christian brotherhood or sisterhood. And so John Wesley, when they gathered together, what were they doing? They were not just limkopi. They are not just having chit-chats uh, that is uh, mindless or meaningless. They were very intentional to be disciples of Jesus and to help one another to be disciples because their environment is not encouraging that. As young men, they group together and they constantly every day, they ask themselves 22 questions and they also be accountable to one another for these 22 questions. Allow me to read to you. Question one. Am I consciously or unconsciously creating the impression that I am better than I really am? In other words, am I a hypocrite? Two, am I honest in all my acts and works or do I exaggerate? Three, do I confidently pass on to others what has been said to me in confidence? Four, can I be trusted? Five, am I a slave to dress, friends, work or habits? Six, am I self-conscious, self-pitying, or self-justifying. Seven, did the Bible live in me today? Eight, do I give the Bible time to speak to me every day? Am I enjoying prayer? Nine, ten, when did I last speak to someone else about my faith? Eleven, do I pray about the money I spent? Twelve, do I get to bed on time and get up on time? Thirteen, do I disobey God in anything? 14. Do I insist upon doing something about which my conscience is uneasy? 15. Am I defeated in any part of my life? 16. Am I jealous, impure, critical, irritable, touchy, or distrustful? 17. Do I spend, how do I spend my spare time? 18. Am I proud? 19. Do I thank God that I'm not as other people, especially as the Pharisees who despise the publican? 20. Is there anyone whom I fear, dislike, disown, criticize, hold a resentment toward or disregard? If so, what am I doing about it? 21. Do I grumble or complain constantly? 22. Is Christ real to me? Every day, John Wesley and his friends in the Holy Club ask themselves this question and they hold one and available, accountable with these questions. Friends in our DG group, ask whether we do journaling or so, susah. But friends, DG uh, is not a policing job. It's not a spiritual babysitting or so. We are so careless to one another. When we meet as a group, we are committed to be serious about growing in Christ. 
and we know we can't do it alone because much is the temptation and trials we face. And that's God knows us very well. That's why He knows and He structure that we be a body. And so it is a challenge for us in our disciple group. It will truly to follow the words of the scripture, to grow together and be responsible for each other. We must be able to be secure enough in our group to share very privately about these very serious and private questions and to be able to answer freely and honestly about it and to be able to admonish, correct and build up each other on this question. The DG group, the disciple group, the small group, the CG, whatever you want to call it, are the ministry of soul caring, that we may be nurtured in maturity. And so friends, when John Wesley was at his deathbed, surrounding him was these friends who have journeyed with him, hold him accountable. And he said in his last uh, few words before he died, farewell, farewell. But the best thing of, all, of it all is God is with us. The best thing of it all is God is with us. It is a journey of faith. We know John Wesley had a strong foundation in faith. He had a love for God, but he had friends and a community of close group of Christians who went through faith together. And therefore he can say, best of it all, and God is with us, not me. You hear that? God is with us. In the Holy Club, at any time, it was never more than 25 people. And of course, we know the Wesley brothers are very famous. You know, they, they were part of a very important, they played a very important role in the revival in the nation in Britain at that time. They brought about a revival that lasted more than 200 years and the fruit of their work is still here today. And we are the fruit of that revival that God has made them part of. But there are other people actually in the Holy Club that because of that discipleship, doing faith, growing together, nurturing and encouraging one another. We have people like John Gambold, who became a Moradian bishop. John Clayton, a distinguished Anglican churchman. James, uh, James Hervey, a religious writer. Benjamin Ingram, a Yorkshire evangelist. Thomas Buckham, secretary of SPCK. SPCK is a UK-based charity organization that champions uh, Christian thinking. How do you actually have uh, books and writings that helps people to articulate and think about the faith? and grow in that faith. Of course, you have George Whitfield, who came in a bit later to the group, who, uh, who is a revivalist, who together with John Wesley uh, preached and brought about revival to uh, America as well. So friends, you can see, of course, we are mentioning those big names. Lah. All right. But let's go back to our own church, in our DG group. Look around in our DG group. We are responsible for one another, right? We have a task to build each other up. We are supposed to uh, build each other so that we are mutually growing. What do you envision in that person that's in your group? That this person may be a person who serves in among uh, the poor or this person is somebody who is doing a great work at the workplace. Among my friends in university, some of us have gone on to be pastors. Some have gone on to be church leaders. Some have gone on to be teachers in far places, in obscure areas. Some have gone in to be uh, um, uh, in corporate world, uh, leading small groups, prayer groups in their workplace. And we look among ourselves. We say, yeah, you know, we thank God that we were able to be helped, to be part of each other, to encourage, to grow, to learn, to teach one another with the word of God. And so, friends, this is my encouragement to all of us as we look at the goal of the church, not just engaging, not just evangelizing, but the goal of it all in disciple-making is that everyone is to become mature in Christ. When we bring somebody into the faith, it doesn't stop there. Stop there. We hope that we can grow the person that they too may reproduce spiritually to become disciples-makers themselves. So it's an ongoing process. And how we need to do is we need to equip and edify one another. The responsibility falls not just 
on the pastors and the uh, staff workers, but on each and every one of us. And we have a responsibility to do that, that our church may be a mature church in Christ Jesus. Let us pray. Let's take this moment to just quieten ourselves before the Lord and ask, Lord, what are you speaking to me this morning? Father, we want to thank you, O God, for your body, the church. We want to thank you, O Lord, for your grace that you have given each and every one of us. Lord, we hear you, that each of us have a part that we need to play, that all may become mature in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we end this three part of the sermon series, as we look at the three roadmaps to disciple making, Lord, we are not we know you're not concerned about just putting out a tagline. You're concerned about us living in accordance to your will. So Lord, we pray will you grant us the deep grace to grow in you. Lord, for some of us, oh God, maybe we have lost the appetite to grow. Perhaps the words of the author of Hebrews should ring in our ears. Have we become slow to understand? Have we become sluggish in wanting to learn? wanting to grow deeper, to wanting to chew solid food instead of just easily taking in spiritual milk. Lord, we pray for a deeper craving, a deeper appetite, a hunger for your word, a hunger to grow. And we pray, O oh Father, O oh Lord, for a deeper love for others because you have put us together in this body. Help us to love by willing to build up another person take up the responsibility to grow each other so we thank you we pray that spirit of the living God will you come and unpack these beautiful truths of your scripture in our lives and speak to us even when we leave this place of what we ought to do this we pray in Jesus name Amen <laughs>